Hey guys, thanks for joining us on Family Life Today here on YouTube. YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. You don't want to miss any episodes, so hit the little bell and you'll get notifications and you won't miss anything. And if this encourages you, like it and, and share, share it with it. your friends. Yeah, share it with your friends. Yeah, welcome to Family Life Today. We're learning these things about each other early in marriage. Well, when those differences start to emerge, you can start to think, did I pick the wrong person? Is there something wrong with me? Is there something wrong with her? She doesn't think like me. He doesn't think like me. And this is where we start to go in bad places rather than going, yeah, we're different and we got to figure out how to honor those differences and appreciate those differences. And in the process of making those adjustments, our marriages can get better. Welcome to Family Life Today, where we want to help you pursue the relationships that matter most. I'm Ann Wilson. And I'm Dave Wilson, and you can find us at FamilyLifeToday.com or on our Family Life app. This is Family Life Today. Today's a special day. Sure is. We have the legend, the Bob legend. Lapine, the voice of Family Life Today. He's actually in the studio in Orlando. Welcome to Family Life Today, Bob. This so, feels so weird. I mean, <laughs> it I, does. I it? am not used to being the passenger. I'm used to being the driver, right? I know. And so you guys say, come sit, but we're driving. And I go, no, <laughs> I want to drive. That's what I'm used to doing. And we want you to drive. That's what I feel like. <laughs> I mean, so just fun. saying welcome to Family Life Today is like, that's your line. <laughs> I, is, I took your line. You did take my line. I mean, what's it feel like walking into to Orlando, a new studio? Well, first of all, it's a privilege to be here. And I, of course, have been following what you guys have been doing since I unplugged a little while ago. But I love what you're all about, what the ministry is all about, how God is using it. So just to be back and to be with you guys, this is a treat for me. And for our listeners that don't know, Bob has been our coach. He's been our mentor. He's really the one that started Family Life. I mean, in many today. ways, you're the reason we're sitting in these chairs yeah. right here. You know, we are eternally grateful. We would not He's be He's the here. reason any listener is listening right <laughs> yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, and they're like hearing your voice and going, oh, I love that yeah. voice. Well, you know, having you here, I thought, I got to do something for Bob Lapine. And so last night I might have sat down with my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> you is knew, there a song you, going? There you is. There's a song. I, did, <laughs> I didn't even stop to think that this was a possibility, but I should have known. You should I? have known. I should have known. I'm figuring if he plays it long enough, you'll get the chorus and you two will both be <laughs> oh, singing. <yeah. laughs> and Ann and hasn't even heard it. No. Uh, nobody's heard it, actually. Uh, maybe a few, but um, and I can't say this is from God, but you know. Um, <laughs> The listeners will definitely say this is not from God. But, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about your life and family life and your book, Love Like You Mean It, and even the cruise being named Love Like You Mean It. I'm, I'm, I know the backstory is you did all of that. <laughs> so I came up with a song called Love Like La Peanut. <laughs> <laughs> family life, Bob, is a man you gotta meet. Deep in theology and a Diet Coke. <laughs> That's true. And he never gets beat. <laughs> Had named that tune. <laughs> and that's true. Sweet that home. Never. Sweet home right there. Mary Ann is his gal and she will blow your mind. Yes, she will. You can comment on every lyric. <laughs> I like it. She brings calm to a storm because she's really, really fine. Amen to that. And he loves him some Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> Went to a party at the counter all the time. <laughs> He's got a love for cheese factory. <laughs> He's eating it like 123. 38, 38. Now. It's actually 138, <laughs> but I just had to rhyme that lyric. Yeah. The Spurs and Popovich consume his nights. 
He's Dr. Love like you mean it at night. <laughs> He's changed the world through family life and millions are grateful. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Love like Lapita. Come on, give me a harmony. Oh, that's good. Love like Lapita. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we need the we need the team to come in and sing it live. <laughs> Love like Lapita. Oh, we got the Woo. chorus. Love like Lapita. You know, there is, there's a songwriting competition show on TV now. You know that, right? And I don't think you should apply. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Hey, that, was, that was sort of fun to have the team come in. That I know. Was fun. Uh, I mean, that that's a, a team you've built over the years. And uh, anyway, that was fun. I like the title. Love I like, like Lapina. <laughs> you know, that I can say God gave to me on an airplane. But um, so you've written a new book. Yes. Called Build a Stronger Marriage, The Path to Oneness. Yes. I mean, we got Love Like You Mean It. You've mm-hmm. written The Christian Husband decades ago. Yeah. I mean, it's been a while. What hit you to say, man, I want to write something that can help couples? You guys know this as well because of your involvement in pastoral ministry and in sitting down with couples. The experience I've had of meeting one-on-one with couples who are trying to make their marriage work, there's some distress. I mean, not where they just can't hold it together, but it's just, it's not what they want it to be, what God wants it to be. And in talking to them, I started to see themes and patterns emerging in our conversations where, you know, I've been talking about marriage and family with people, doing interviews with people for more than a quarter of a century. And I thought there are some things that I don't remember hearing explored the way that I think they need to be explored that are some of the issues that are coming up in these marriages over and over again. And so I thought, if I could have a book that a mentor couple could take a couple, maybe they're newly married, they're just trying to work out the kinks, you know? They're just trying to get some of that, those early frustrations, or maybe they've they've hit a spot in their marriage or 20 years in and they've just, they've found themselves in isolation, and they don't know how to get back. I wanted to have a book where a pastor or a counselor or a mentor couple could walk through this process with them and help them isolate and identify that's our issue. That's where the issue's coming from, and then figure out how to deal with it so that they can get to where God wants their marriage to be. Yeah, and you start early in the book saying that many couples experience just what you said, this disappointment— isolation. And, you know, listeners know our story of that happened within six months. But, you know, when when Ann and I experienced that in six months, we sort of thought we were unique. Hmm. Like she says, Mary News, biggest mistake of my life. I did not think most couples feel that way. You start the book saying, nah, it's pretty common. I think most couples feel it and think, I can't say anything because you see each other at church on Sunday or you see each other in some mm-hmm. social setting. Everybody's got their best face on. They're putting on their best performance. Nobody knows that anybody's got any issues going on. So we all go home from the small group meeting or the church meeting and we think, I don't know why mine's not working. Mm-hmm. Everybody else's seems to be working. What we don't know is that the people who we thought their marriage was working, they're at home having the same conversation, right. thinking our marriage is all together. And this is where I think we do have to kind of step out and say, you know what? There's dysfunction in all of our marriages. There are issues. Some of it's significant in some marriages. Some of it is minor in other marriages. But if we can just get it out on the table. I love Ray Ortland, who I know you guys know and have had on the program. When he was a pastor at Emmanuel Church in Nashville, they had what they called the Emmanuel mantra. And the Emmanuel mantra at their church was, I'm a complete idiot. That's the first thing. (laughs) Number two is, my future is incredibly bright. And number three is, anybody can get in on this. Mm. Wow. And and I thought, let's apply that to marriage. I'm a complete idiot in marriage, (laughs) but the future is bright because of what God's done and, and our understanding, and anyone can get in on it. I think most couples don't know 
that the future is bright and that there's a way to get in on it. And that's what I'm hoping this book will provide for folks. So, Bob, our listeners, many, most know you. They have known your name. They know your story. But take us into your life with Marianne. You're super extroverted. Like you could just, you and Dave remind me so much of each other. <laughs> and Marianne's introverted. Yeah. And so when you guys got married, did you face that situation where you thought, oh, this isn't what I thought it would be? We faced all kinds. I mean, that's just one example of the differences between the two of us that when we started marriage, just little things. We dated for four years. I mean, I thought— You thought I, you knew her. I thought, yeah, I, I know just about everything. But here's one of the things I've learned over the years is there's a lot that is under the surface, and you assume— that your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your spouse, you assume that they're going to think one way or act another way until the actual moment where it comes to light and you go, oh, I always thought you would make this choice. I always thought that would be your preference. Just because we can't unpack it all. I've been married 43 years and there's still stuff I'm figuring out, still stuff I'm learning after 43 years. It's an ongoing process. And this is where early in marriage, those differences take us by surprise. So the introvert, the extrovert side of things, where I would just assume Marianne would be somebody who would like to be in the spotlight or the limelight. If we're in a group, I would say, well, Marianne would have something she'd want to say about this or ask Marianne what she thinks. And she's dying, (laughs) going, why are you pointing, why are you singling me out? And I'm going, Because I like when people ask me my opinion. And she goes, I just want to be over here. So we're learning these things about each other early in marriage. Well, when when you don't know that going in, when those differences start to emerge, you can start to think, did I pick the wrong person? Is there something wrong with me? Is there something wrong with her? She doesn't think like me. He doesn't think like me. And this is where we start to go in bad places rather than going – yeah, we're different, and we got to figure out how to honor those differences and appreciate those differences and learn from those differences. Well, what should we do? I mean, when we experienced that six months in and then a year in, we thought exactly what you said. And right. we knew better, but we still felt like, I think if I was married to somebody else, if she was married, we'd be happier. Yeah. And I know almost every couple I've talked to is like, I've had that thought So if you're sitting there and you're feeling that disappointment, the expectations you have are not, you know, living out in reality, what's your counsel to them? What should they do? Well, I think the first thing you have to recognize is that every moment is not a defining moment in your marriage. So there are seasons you'll go through where things are going to rise to the surface. That doesn't mean it's the new normal. I had to learn that there were particular times in the month when Marianne would act differently than she acted during other times of the month. I didn't have to assume that in those odd moments, that was her new normal. No, it was just she was having a moment. I have moments. We all have our moments. Rather than thinking that somebody in a stressful situation or somebody in a life's hard, you're sad. You you don't have to think that's now the new normal. You just have to leave some breathing room and pour a lot of grace on top of those moments. I think that's a really good point because what I've done in our marriage is we get to this point where we're really struggling. And I think, this is it. Yeah. This is our future. And it's always going to be like this. And you're saying, no, it's just a moment. I've never forgotten hearing about a study that was done in the state of Oklahoma. In fact, I shared this a number of times on Family Life Today, so some listeners who've been listening for a while may remember this. But a study done in the state of Oklahoma where they went and found couples who had filed for divorce but had never gone through with it. And it had to be at least five years old or older. So they went to these couples who five years or more ago had filed for divorce, and they asked them about their marital satisfaction today. And 80-plus percent of those couples, on a scale of one to five, said their marriage was a four or a five. It was great today. And these were couples who five or more years ago had wanted a divorce. So what happened? Well, time happened, and situations adjust, and we grow and learn, and we learn about each other, and we learn how to complement one another instead of competing with one another— And we learn that fine art of blending and becoming one in marriage rather than thinking, 
yeah, this this is the new normal. I have this tendency to think if Marianne says something on a particular day when she's stressed out and frustrated, if she says, I never want to do that in my life, I think she means that. <laughs> She's serious, and I should remember, she never wants to do that again, only to find out a few days later <laughs> that she was frustrated in the moment. <laughs> and she said, I never want to. She, what, she didn't really mean that. But we have to recognize that in the, in the ebb and flow of marriage and life, we make adjustments. We grow. We get better. We learn. We learn things we didn't know about each other. We learn things we didn't know about ourselves. And in the process of making those adjustments, our marriages can get better. And your kids get older. <laughs> they do, uh, they right? I'm just going to say, because some of you are in that stage right now where you are dying because you've got three kids that are under three, and you think, I don't even know if we can make it. Yeah, stress levels change. Exactly. I mean, the, the three under three stress level is different than the 14, 15, 16-year-old stress level. But, but it's but yes, stage. The, the moment passes. You can get on. You can catch your breath. You just need to know in the moment, how do you breathe? Yeah. How do you support one another? How do you look at each other? And as we have talked about for years at the weekend, remember, you're not the enemy. I'm not the enemy. We're going to get through this together. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. Now let's figure out how we tackle what's causing the frustration today. I know that the study you quoted, did you say it was Oklahoma? Tim Keller uses that study in the Meaning of Marriage book. And I remember reading that because he said, as you— sort of analyze the study, you're like, these couples are really happy now. Yes. And they almost got divorced. And so when I read that, I remember thinking, just hang on, because you quit and you give up. I mean, I've said this here before, but I remember asking my dad, you know, they got divorced when I was a little boy, I was seven years old. I'm a man now. I'm a pastor in Detroit. He came to see me. And I had never asked my dad this question in in my entire life. I was scared to even ask it. I was driving. He was sitting in the passenger seat. We're going to a band rehearsal. I'm a musician because he was a drummer. So it was this sort of cool moment. But I just said to my dad, hey, dad, did you ever regret the divorce? Before I finish this sentence, he emotionally blurts out blank yes. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked. Mm -hmm. I was like, what do you mean? And he just said, I wish we would have fought harder. I missed your whole life. I missed so many things. We gave up too quickly. Mm. And again, that's just my story. But I think a lot of couples, if they would just fight for it, and I know it's hard because yeah. someone's listening right now and they're like, dude, you don't know how bad mine is. Yep, I know how bad it is. I was in that home. And if you just hold on. But at the same time, things you're saying, Bob, you got to make some adjustments. You got to learn. You got to grow. You can't just say, I'm just going to hold on. You've got to change or you're never going to get out of that yeah. pit. I'm thinking of a couple I know right now who would be in the hold on phase. And they're trying to get some help for their marriage. But honestly, the breakthrough's not happening. So I think a lot of what happens is couples... They get sideways with one another, they get into distress. They think, we've got to get some help. They may get some counseling, and then they start to look around and go, nobody knows how to fix our problem. Hmm. And at that point, they either say, so, the, the couple I'm thinking of, they live under the same roof, but that's about all that's going on in terms of the marriage. Hmm. The, the pretense is there, but the marriage is is empty. It's not hold on and just grit it out and maybe something magical will happen, right? Right. But perseverance is part of the issue. And then a commitment to say, okay, if we went here and didn't get help, we're going to go somewhere else. And then we're going to go somewhere else. And we're going to keep trying to tackle this thing rather than just saying, well, we tried one thing and that didn't work. So I guess nobody has the answers. Or we've done everything we know to do mm. and none of it's worked. Well, Go to a counselor. Go to a weekend to remember. Get get a book. Get a mentor couple to walk through. Put energy in That's this right. Yeah. yeah. Work on fixing. The illustration, you've heard me use this illustration. If when you got married, if I gave you a brand new car and I said, this is a gift, it's a brand new car, here's the deal. Nice. Well, here's the deal. It's a great car, but here's the deal. It's the only car you can have for the rest of your life. We'll upgrade it with technology as it comes along, but this is going to be your car. Two things would happen. Number one, you would take really good care of that car yep. because you know this has got to go the distance. Second thing that has happened is you would say, when it breaks down, I guess I have to go pay the money and get it fixed. It needs a transmission. I don't have any option but a new transmission because it's the only car I'm going to have. If we would treat our marriage the same way, 
and say, this is the only marriage I'm going to have for the rest of my life. So I'm going to take better care of it. And when it breaks down, because it will, uh, it might need an oil change, some maintenance. It might need a new transmission. I'll go get that because this is it for the rest of my life. I think we've got to have that kind of a mindset when it comes to marriage. Uh, But what about the spouse that they're willing, they want to do all of that, but their spouse is like, "Uh uh-uh. Ooh, that's a good question. You're listening to Dave and Ann Wilson with Bob Lapine on Family Life today. We're going to hear Bob's answer in just a second. But first, what would it look like if marriages across the country started moving toward oneness, toward seeing each other as God's good gift? Think of the changed lives just within each family, and then imagine those changed lives reaching out to neighbors and communities. It changed the world. It starts with one couple one family, one home at a time. So let me ask you, would you help transform families by giving to Family Life? All this week, when you partner financially with us, we want to send you a copy of Bob Lapine's latest book, Build a Stronger Marriage. It's going to be our thanks to you when you give and help families this week at familylifetoday.com or when you call with your donation at 800 358 6329. That's 800 F is in family, L is in life, and then the word today. All right. Now, what happens when you want to work on your marriage, but your spouse is like, nah, I'm good? Great question. Here's Bob Lapine. That's a, a really hard situation. And that's where I think you have to find the strength to persevere somewhere other than your spouse. So th- the first place is you go to the Lord yeah, and you say, I need you to be my strength. I need you to be the one who helps me persevere in the heartache and the hardship because you're going to have both. You're going to have the the heartache because marriage is not what you want it to be or what you wish it would be. And you're going to have the hardship because you don't know how to to fix things. Go to the Lord, cry out to him, read the Psalms, see the psalmist, in my distress, Lord, I come to you, I cry, you're my refuge, you're my strength. And then the second thing you do is you've got to have some people outside your marriage who are your people, who you can go to where you can get refreshed, you can get people praying with you and for you. They got to be the right people. Yeah, They can't be people who complain or who gossip and— Or say, I told you you should have never married him. But yeah, somebody that when your faith is weak and you're weary, they'll help carry you. They'll cheer you on, right? They'll cheer you on. And one of my thoughts was going back to your car analogy is, you know, we know the purpose of the car is to drive. Right. I think when we look at marriage, we think the car is supposed to make us happy. And when we're not happy, there's another car. Yeah. Does that contribute to— Not finding fulfillment in my marriage, not knowing why I'm married. I think that's the starting place for couples who are at that point in a marriage where they go, this is not what I thought it was going to be. This is not what I want it to be. Well, let's go back and say, what did you think it was going to be and what did you want it to be? And I know for me, when I got married, what I thought it was going to be was I've met a woman who thinks I'm special And if I marry her, then I've got a live-in, thinks I'm special person (laughs) who's just going to spend all the time just reminding me of how special I am. Every day. Yes. Yes. Because when we went on dates, she laughed at my jokes and she she seemed to admire. She'd smile, look at me, and I'd say, what do you think? And she'd say, I'm just looking at you and go, yes, yes, I want that all the time, right? How long did that last? (laughs) (laughs) Well, the the, the whole point is I started with this this desire for marriage. It was all about what am I going to get out of this? Mm. How am I going to benefit from this? And so as soon as I'm not getting what I had thought I was going to be getting for life, even better now that we're married— as soon as that's not happening every day, I start to go, well, wait, wait, wait. This is this is like those things you buy on late night TV. They look good in the infomercial, <laughs> but they just don't play out in real life. It'd right? be so interesting for us all to think, <laughs> what did you think you were getting? Yes. Because we all of us have a picture of what it should have looked like. We get married, and, and sometimes our motives are not great. Like, we're getting married because— 
the biological clock is ticking. If I don't get married now, I'll never have kids and I want to have kids. Or I'm getting married to get my mother off my back because she keeps saying, are you dating anybody? I mean, there's any number of reasons, superficial motivations for getting married. And then you combine that with this image that what marriage is supposed to be about is certain of my wants and needs are going to be fulfilled on a regular basis. If that's the transactional nature of your marriage, I'm getting married so that certain of my wants and needs will be fulfilled on an ongoing basis, you've started with the wrong premise. Because the Bible says that the reason for two people to come together, the reason for a man to leave father and mother and cleave to his wife and for the two to become one, is so that together you can advance the work of God's kingdom in the world in a way that would be better than if the two of you were single. Now, I wasn't thinking anything like that. Most of us. Yeah. Majority of us don't think that. But when we come around and go, oh, wait. So the verse that sticks out for me here is Psalm 34, 3. And somebody had brought this verse up to me, and I'd never thought of it in a marriage context. I'd heard the verse for years. And somebody said, this is the marriage verse. And it's a verse many listeners will know. It's a verse that says, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Mm. What's the purpose of marriage? Mm. A man leaves his father and mother, cleaves to his wife, the two become one, so that together we can magnify the Lord and exalt his name. And when we start to go, that's God's purpose for us getting married, so that together we glorify him, magnify him, and exalt him. Now, all of a sudden, how my needs are being met or how your needs are being met— that's really secondary to the the bigger question, which is, is God being exalted? Is he being magnified? Is he being glorified through us? And when you start to make that the priority and both of you are focused on that, it's so interesting how the little trivial stuff just kind of drops off. You're it's on like, mission together. Exactly. And I think, Bob, that's so good. And that takes maturity and surrender to me. When you start seeing Jesus and seeing that he has a bigger plan for me, but also for our marriage, that changes things. It takes our eyes off of ourselves. You've been listening to Dave and Ann Wilson with Bob Lapine on Family Life Today. His book is called Build a Stronger Marriage, and we'll send you a copy when you give any amount today at familylifetoday.com. Is it possible your current marriage problems are a result of past habits or maybe old feelings? Well, Bob Lapine joins Dave and Ann again tomorrow to talk about how to build a stronger marriage. That's tomorrow. On behalf of Dave and Ann Wilson, I'm Shelby Abbott. We'll see you back next time for another edition of Family Life Today. Family Life Today is a production of Family Life, a crew ministry, helping you pursue the relationships that matter most.